My name is Adora Raji. I'm one of the organizers of this workshop series, along with Kate, Nick, and Gildas, who are here. We're all students in the Sustainable Development Masters here in PS Group Science Policy Research Unit. We're so excited to have so many people joining us today. Thank you to our speakers and you including for accepting our invitation to be here and to the university and business school for supporting us. First of all, we're recording this session. So if you don't want to be recorded, you can turn off the camera or leave and watch the session later. And this applies to people here too. We have muted everyone, but please remain muted except during the discussions and questions we are going to raise your hands to speak. Today we'll be hearing from Nemo Basi and Ashish Kotari, who are international researchers and thought leaders in the area of alternative development paradigm, ecological justice, ecological democracy, amongst others. Unfortunately, unfortunately we can't be here with us in person. We also have our discussant, Sarah Barora, who is recovering from his second dose of the vaccine. So he's joining us on Zoom. And Andrew Sterling, who is here in person. Thank you, Andy. They are professors, Sarah Banandi are senior lecturers and co-directors of the Sustainable Development MSD, Sustainable Development MSD at school. Following each presentation, there will be five minutes of contribution from one of our discussants, and later on we'll have our QA, contributions and comments before wrapping up. While the presentations are going on, feel free to use the chat box for your questions. And if you're prepared to speak, please wait till the QA session and unmute yourself. Our first speaker is Nimo Basi. Nimo is an architect, writer, poet, and he's also the director of the Ecological Think Tank, Health of Mother Earth Foundation, and member of the steering committee of Oil Watch International, a network resisting the expansion of fossil fuels extraction in the global south. He was chair of, he was chair of friends of Earth International, an executive director of Nigerian Environmental Rights Action between 1993 and 2013. He was a co recipient of the 2010 Rights Livelihood Award, also known as the Alternative Global Prize. In 2012, he received the Rafto Human Rights Award. In 2014, he received Nigeria's National, award, National Honor as member of the Federal Government, MFR, in recognition for his environmental activity, activism. And he also has an honorary doctorate from the University of York, UK, in 2019. His books include We Thought He Was Oil, But He Was Blood, where is a poetry. I think this was released in, 20, in 2002. And also, I Will Not Dance to Your Feet. He has another book called To Cook a Continent, Destructive Extraction and the Climate Crisis in Africa. And another one, Oil Politics, Echoes of Ecological War. He also runs a blog, ATUM, meaning Good Living. You're welcome to School News, I see. Thank you so much, Adelra. Um, and thanks to all the colleagues who have invited me to, to share on this webinar. Uh, it's so great to be on the panel with Ashis and, and to see all of you joining us today. So I'll be speaking on uh, a very fluid topic, footpaths of harmony. Uh, and I, I chose this deliberately because uh, I believe that we have to challenge our imaginaries as we work towards uh, bringing things back to balance, considering, considering how far gone in the wrong direction the world has moved. So I'll be sharing my slides. Uh, and, um, you know, as, uh, to, to, to ensure that I stay on track, uh, otherwise I may get lost in the jungle, uh, as they say. So, um, when we talk about footpaths, uh, footpaths are very interesting, interesting things because they, they, they lead you to certain destinations, uh, but sometimes there could be problems, it could be difficulties on the, on the pathways, uh, but they nevertheless, they, 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 guide, they guide us on where we want to go. And the roots, roots are very important. Of recent, I've been thinking a lot about roots because uh, if, if you're living a, in a, a swampy environment, for example, you find that roots are extremely important, whether the roots of mangroves.
you know, I think we lost you. You can still see your screen, but you're frozen. can hear us, can you give the chat the message in the chat box? He's just dropped off. Yeah. Okay. Lost him. Hopefully he comes back soon. Oh yes. Very good. I'm really sorry about that. Uh, I'm sorry about that, but it's one of the things that we'll have to contend with out here. Uh, <laughs> so so uh, we take it in our stride. Thanks for your understanding. Um, I, I, I suspect I was making some very important points. That's why the internet failed. Uh, so I, <laughs> I just tried to say a few more things about it. I'm not sure exactly where it went off, but I was talking about roots and pathways. And it so when we're working for harmony, our pathways are important. But the roots may be the very things that will, that will hold us to ensure that we don't, don't get swallowed along the way. So the roots are landscape markers, the place markers, the, the, the environment for life. Uh, in, in the swampy or coastal region, this is where uh, juveniles of fishery, fishes, uh, species grow. This is where they breed. And it's very important to local economies and local culture and even spiritual exercises. So this is critically important for us to think about. Uh, and then as we consider uh, the pathways to harmony, it's important for us to understand that we don't see everything. There are many things we don't get to see. And what we see is a tiny fraction of what is and what exists. And critically, we need to be in harmony with both what we see and what we don't see. In a, in a spoonful of healthy soil, there are millions, if not billions, of living organisms. Uh, and so even when you march on the ground, you have to keep a certain level of harmony with the ground, with the soil, with the earth, and understand that our linkages are extremely important. Now, uh, when we consider the total biomass of life on earth, we find that the human race occupies just a tiny fraction, 0.01% of the life on earth. This should be very humbling. And considering that we are uh, the worst, perhaps the worst predators on the planet, we actually should humble ourselves and, and relate better with other beings on earth because we're all relatives. We're relative with insects, with animals, with trees and rivers and hills. And we have to live in harmony with all this. Now, what has, what has made us so, uh, so, harmful, so destructive to our environment. There are political roots to the environmental harms that we see. Uh, there are things that help us to, that propels humans to believe that we can externalize costs and carry out all kinds of corruption, entrench inequalities, enforce, just to enforce the concentration of capital and power in a few hands. And so for me, to, to build harmony uh, in our existence with one another and with other relatives on planet Earth, we have to take political action. Political action is extremely important. And when I say political action, I'm not just talking about um, partisan politics, but every action we take is for the politics of harmony with all beings on earth, both visible and invisible. And I always keep this in mind. This drawing here shows Rhodes, one of the worst dictators and colonizers who, who, who ran riot across the African continent. Uh, now, it reminds me of what Nkrumah, the first president of, the, of Ghana, said that the worst form of imperialism is exploitation without responsibility. And here we remind ourselves that humans have presented ourselves as masters on the planet uh, and that we can control our destiny, we can grab whatever is available and transform for our needs. Uh, and so sometimes we forgo a sense of responsibility especially when we feel threatened. You can see the example of the coronavirus. The whole world feels threatened, and so we lower all the, all the rules. Uh, corporations produce vaccines who want to stay alive. 
You don't have any responsibility. What happens to anybody? Uh, uh, this may be an extreme case, but it actually explains why. It's the logic that makes us accept impunity. Uh, the same thing that accepted the kill, the massacre in Marikana in 2012, where miners were asking for better wages and they were met with lethal bullets. That kind of logic that allows oil corporations to damage the Ogoni environment, the Nigerian environment, to, to extremely just destroy everything uh, and only care about the profit and this, the, this countenance any sense of harmony with the environment, with the communities, with other beings. Uh, this is the same logic that we can exploit without accountability. And for us to, re to build harmony, which we can't avoid forever, if we want to remain on this planet with other beings, there must be a duty of care, a sense of care. We have to learn to enjoy living in, a, in harmony with other, with other things around us. We have to be ready to, to, to allow ourselves to be vulnerable and not just to master everything, to enjoy what we have around us. Uh, we have to understand that the, the pursuit of growth, of unending growth, is actually drowning and suffocating many right now. Uh, 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 I hear the news I see on TV about what's going on in the floods in some parts of Europe, in Germany, in, in Belgium. And uh, it just tells me that no matter how industrialized a society is, we are not, we are not immune to impacts of harms and dislocations with our relationship with our planet, our climate, and everything else around us. And so on ending growth is simply unsustainable. This is why also when people talk about sustainable development, we're putting two contradictory terms together. Development and sustainability may, may begin from the same notion, from the same uh, level, but they can't go far because they are counter to, contrary to one another. Uh, is this kind of development, I, I keep on showing uh, these harmful photos because I want us to understand. I mean, this is like a picture of hair, but this is the reality of at least about 200 communities in the Niger Delta with gas furnaces burning, uh, give a picture of, uh, of hair with bombs dropped in them. And, and this kind of destruction that you see on the slide right now that should urge us to redefine what we mean by growth and development. We can't grow at all costs. The current paradigm, paradigm of growth is growth at all costs. And it has brought the planet, brought humans to the precipice. And if we insist on going that direction, we're certainly going uh, in what can best be termed as willful blindness. And this reminds me, I just talked about the floods in Europe but remember also that there are floods, ongoing floods in Nigeria. We are losing land, we are losing territory, we are losing uh, resources. In, in Mozambique in 2019 and even early this year, there were devastating cyclones that are intensifying and more are expected to come uh, as, as time progresses. And you know, what are the solutions? What are we doing? What, what, is, what are humans thinking about to solve some of these problems? And because our imagination is hooked on the fact of power and control and ability to transform nature, to help nature, to master nature. We have very dangerous imaginaries and silver bullets and techno fixes that are bound to create more problems. I'm talking about geoengineering, radiation management, spaces, space mirrors, space sunshades, and ocean fertilization, and all kinds of devices that are being drawn up by nations and corporations uh, in, in the path we're trying to, and I mean, on the promise that they are aiming at net zero emissions. In other words, we are going to keep emitting, but we know we can get the emissions absorbed, either we capture them or, and bury them, or we're going to get trees to capture them, and therefore we don't need to change our way of living. This is clearly stupid, but this is, uh, this is the argument we're hearing in climate negotiations, and this is what corporations like Shell, Exxon, and the rest are busy announcing that they're going to achieve net zero. But we are going to achieve net zero in 2050, in, in 2100, or, or, or what, some other dates. Uh, we just see that this is clearly um, uh, something that is not sustainable and we should actually rethink. So thinking, working towards harmony, uh, footpaths of harmony, 
As I will just share this slide and talk a bit about what we are trying to do at Health of Mother Foundation. Uh, we, we are looking at stilt roots. And I showed you a picture of mangrove, beautiful, lush mangroves in the Niger Delta before destruction came. But we think that we can restore these roots and use the outcome of that restoration to rebuild and regain power. Because political power is what would help us to move in the direction that we should go by harnessing people's power and getting people in a position to determine what goes on around them, what the redefining growth defining the good life, defining well-being, and putting boundaries to what corporations and individuals can do. And so through the maintenance of the stilt roots, we can support fisheries, we can obtain energy, of course we obtain oxygen, and these are very excellent uh, carbon sinks. Uh, livelihoods are built on these food systems, and of course management systems. Um, and this will help us, help us to to, to ignore and shift away from power, dirty energy, uh, which is the predominant means of energy production at the moment. We need to change this. We need to try to, to, to move away from this. So now looking at the ideas we have towards building this harmony by putting people in place of power, we're looking at what are the sources of energy. We can have energy from nature. We can have like renewable energy. We can, of course, depend on dirty energy, which is also from a transformation of nature in a bad way. Uh, now, the needs we need, livelihoods, we need energy, we need our food, we need to maintain our culture. Dirty energy doesn't maintain, it gives us artificial culture and globalization in a, sense, in a way that damages solidarity and disconnects people uh, and damages our health. But if working with nature gives us by balance, the outcome is good health. And then we can enhance our power. And that power is what can help us overthrow the system and restore harmony with nature. So the food paths to harmony is Mother Earth. It's either we respect Mother Earth or we descend into the world from barbarism. We can't, there are no two ways about it. We don't have middle grounds. And so, in summary, what I've been saying for the past few minutes is that for us to build the pathways to harmonious living with nature, with one another and with other species on the planet is that we must reconnect with nature. We have to recover our soul. We have to recover who we are as humans and our place in, 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 in nature, in the natural uh, state of things. Uh, we should go beyond, just think about ourselves, how much resource we have to shoot ourselves into space for a few minutes, whereas many are drowning in floods by global warming and fires are raging in the Amazon and in other forests. Violence in Mozambique and, and, and destroyers are setting their claws and talons on the oil fields of Okavango in Namibia and, and, and Botswana. We have to recognize that we have an intergenerational responsibility and accountability to make. And so this is uh, a clarion, uh, I, I'm, I'm just in a word saying that this is time for us to rethink who we are, where we are, and where we want to go. And that's where I draw the curtain for this moment. We can step up this conversation later on. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Nima. Um, that was amazing. That was a very good presentation. And I'm sure we already have questions, both online and here in person. Before we move over to the Q&A, you can use the chat box. We'll have a Q&A later on after Ashish's presentation. But before that, we're going to get comments from one of our discussants, Andy Sterling. Sure. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Adora. Thank you so much. Um, can you hear me all right on the uh, Thank you, Zoom Andy. world? Thank you, Andy. Or does it need to come closer to the speaker? What? Yeah, we can. If we can hear him, but it'd be great if Andy can face the camera because right now we're looking at his head, back of his head. Oh, <laughs> that's not my best part. <laughs> I was wondering myself. So, well, uh, you know, thank you so much for that wonderful talk. Uh, it was inspiring, and, and just like your wider work, you and 
colleagues at the Health of Mother Earth Foundation really, really an inspiration, both politically and intellectually, for people doing work like we do here in Sussex. And um, I think, in particular, something that came out, you know, comes out in that body of work, insofar as I, I, I'm, you know, um, able to, to to judge it, is that this point that's so crucial that environmentalism in privileged circles in the world is in danger of forgetting the crucial roles played, in your words, by people power, right through in raising the issues in the first place, the inseparability of environmentalism, social justice issues, the importance of power and control. Because as you pointed out in the talk briefly there, that without that point being made as clearly as you made it, uh, important agendas like net zero, like degrowth that you alluded to are obviously crucial, but they're in danger of themselves sometimes becoming technocratic. So I think what you bring here and the way you've encapsulated it in this talk and the other work is, is really important for that. And I, I wish you uh, uh, all speed in, uh, in what you're doing there. Um, so I just have three little questions to just think about. They're not particularly good questions, but just to think about before I think we come to the discussion later. Um, the first one is a kind of obvious one, really. In your, I think, absolutely crucial focus on harmony, what is the role of contention? I don't mean, of course, violence. I mean just contention, agonism. Do you have a, a what is the balance error, if you like? And, and likewise, in what you said about roots and pathways, I, we've been talking about pathways a lot here in Sussex, and it's uh, I think a, a powerful metaphor, but I like the way you've added roots to it, and that does a lot of um, a lot of work. But whether it's roots or pathways, maybe the most important thing about both is the S that you put on the end, the plural. Um, so then that raises a challenge which we often struggle with: how to strike again this harmonic balance you're talking about between that kind of pluralism, putting that S on the end at the same time as holding as a need for firm, normative, political commitments. How can one do that without compromising on one or the other, either the pluralism or the commitment? I don't know if you have advice for that perennial struggle. And then the third question, and of course you don't need to answer any of these because these are things that I don't think I have any answer in the long run, but you mentioned don't forget what you cannot see. And again, I think that's a really important encapsulated message. But then, in referring, as you've done, to the language of care and of harmony, as we do too, what about the unseen politics of power and privilege behind the languages of care and harmony? They're often unseen for convenient reasons. How can we at the same time respect the importance of the care and harmony that you've highlighted, but also see the way those ideas are sometimes manipulated? So, Thank you so much for your talk. I'll be thinking about it in some more. Thank you, Andy. Thank you very much. Um, Imo, do you want to answer any of his questions now, or do you want to leave it till later when we have more questions for you? Um, well, thanks a lot, Andy. I think uh, it may be better for me to respond to them now because. Uh, later on, there may be a lot more things to talk about. <laughs> that is, I, may, I may forget. Um, Thank you so much for those comments and questions. I think the, the questions are actually issues for further, further reflection. And so uh, please don't expect definitive responses to them. Um, uh, issue of, um, uh, and again, um, I may not have heard very clearly some of the things because it's a big, it's, the sound from that room is a bit hollow and echoing. Uh, now talk about harmony and the potential. Uh, what do I see as the potential to, to reach harmony? Of course, if the world continues with the kind of power relations we have right now, uh, the geopolitics, the sense of, uh, of privilege and all that, and people being locked in with the sense that, um, you know, they can only negotiate what concerns other people and not what concerns them, achieving that harmony would be a bit difficult, far-fetched. But if we... If, if humans can take personal action, to make personal decisions uh, and adjust the way they live and relate 
I believe we can repair this disruption between us and nature and the environment. So at the personal level, but of course at the bigger level has to be political, we have to come together and solidarity is extremely important. This way we have to build bridges between our regions across the world, north, south, west and east. And then we can, by sharing our stories and experiences, uh, we can actually bring about a, a dramatic changes. But if we work in silos, that would be difficult. Uh, uh, because, and again, you mentioned about roots and, the, and pathways and the earth, we're living on the earth, we all, maybe not all, some people are trying to live in space or go to some asteroids or go to move the moon or Mars, uh, but most of us live here on earth, we don't have the, uh, we're not thinking of moving away from the planet. Um, the way we live is actually dependent on our imagination. If we can just imagine things differently, we can live differently. If we don't change our mindset, if we don't force, even force our mind, just dream, go back to re recover who we are as humans and where we came from. If we don't do that, it's going to be very difficult. Uh, so we are challenging ourselves to do that. And we can't do this at a global scale without changing global politics. And we can't change global politics except we change our local politics. And this is why it's important that we don't discount, discount or discountenance what we can't see. What we can see is a dream that we have in our hearts. And that is what can help us build the future. And all that we can organize in the webinars, the coming together on the streets, coming together in protests and organizing and all things we do, these are pathways we're building towards realizing that dream that we have in our heart. And the duty of care is something we cannot, cannot ignore. We have that, all of us have that, and we have to give account to Mother Earth on, on that count also. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you Mo, for this um, for this session. And I knew that Andrew responded very well to this because he's the biggest crusader of plural pathways. Um, <laughs> and he's very friendly to commemoration. However, we will continue to Ashish, um, Ashish Kodani's session, and after that, we take uh, we we'll have general conversation and Q and A at the end. So our next speaker is Ashish Kodari. Ashish is a founder member of Indian Environmental Group. I'm not sure I can pronounce it, but um, he has taught at the Indian Institute of Public Administration, coordinated the Indian National Biodiversity Strategy and Action Plan process. Served on Greenpeace International and, in, and Greenpeace Indian Board. He has helped initiate the Global ICCA Consortium. He has participated in people's movements, including Namada, Pachal, and Roland. He has coordinated the Vikal Sangam, the Global Tapestry of alternative, Alternatives, and Radical Ecology Democracy Network. He has co-authored and co-edited many books, including Turning the Head, Making, the global, Making of Global India, with Asim Shirabasta, Alternative Features, India on Shackle, and one of my very favorite, Flow Reverse, the Flow Development Dictionary, co-edited with, um, alongside Ariel Saleh, Arturo Escobar, Federico de Maria, and Alberto Escobar. You're welcome to school. Thank you, Laura, and uh, all the other colleagues for uh, this opportunity. Thanks to SPRU uh, and all the institutions that made this possible. And of course, it's always an honor to share a panel with uh, with Mo. It's also a huge advantage to go after him because he's already explained a lot of the basics um, much better than I can. So, uh, and especially like what's what's going wrong, what's going wrong with the world and what is it that we need to do. Uh, so I'm going to try and just uh, piggyback on what he said, build on it, maybe give some experiences from this part of the world to amplify, complement uh, what, what he has already said. Uh, let me see if I can share. Can you see the slides? Uh, Adara, can you see the slides? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, okay. So, uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, a notion that emerges from India, but I think has uh, relevance all over and is kind of linked to 
uh, a lot of what uh, Nemo has said and other activists in other parts of the world in terms of the kind of conceptions and pathways out of the multiple crises that we're in. I'm also very glad that he spoke about roots because the way I'm using the word radical here is precisely that. Radical means going to the roots, though unfortunately it has been distorted to mean uh, extremist violence. So uh, this is only going to show one or two sides of, of what I call the bad news, because like I said, Nemo has already explained this. If you look at the way in which a certain notion of development, especially economic growth-based development, has been imposed all over the world, uh, in the name of improving human conditions and so on, it actually has meant enormous amounts of violence to the rest of nature, violence to communities, especially communities across the world who depend most on uh, nature and natural resources for their livelihoods and their sustenance. But uh, in the long run, uh, in fact, uh, violence against each one of us. And so I call this a process of moving from what were livelihoods that were not just jobs, separate from and distinct from the rest of life, but encompassed within cultural, social, ecological systems. Not that they were perfect, there were many problems, but nevertheless, there was more holistic way of looking at occupations as livelihoods to what we now have is uh, what I call deadlyhoods, where hundreds of millions of people are being displaced and dispossessed from the livelihoods. And a lot of what is created in the modern sector, such as, for instance, in the IT industry, are extremely soul deadening non-creative jobs where just most most people are just part of a long production change with no uh, job satisfaction whatsoever and then we've seen in the covid period uh, two very broad directions one is where governments and private corporations in most parts of the world have used this as an opportunity for gaining uh, or capturing more power and more profits uh, we've seen, for instance, billionaires have become a trillion billion dollar, a trillion dollars more uh, richer just in this last one and a half years, uh, even as hundreds of millions of people have lost their jobs or livelihoods. On the other hand, we're also seeing during the COVID period uh, expression of human solidarity, exactly the kind of thing that Nemo spoke about, where people have sort of jumped out of their skins to help each other, to help young people helping the elderly, people helping to make sure that people have enough food, that health uh, is being ensured and so on and so forth. And I think it's the second part of the human nature that we see, which is that of being able to work in solidarity, work in harmony, work uh, with each other, work with empathy, that we would like to emphasize a lot when we're looking for alternatives. So then the question that arises really is, I remember when I was in uh, high school and, and in college and we started our environmental activism, uh, we were always told that, yeah, okay, you know, some environment damage is there, but it, it's necessary for India to develop. Uh, this is the pathway that all countries have to take and there is no alternative. And so this question of, is there an alternative becomes very, very important. Uh, and part of it, uh, Nimo has already spoken about. Um, just to complement that, I think there's sort of two broad ways in which, we, in which one can look at alternatives. And one is resistance, where people are uh, protesting against the kind of destruction of their lives and their, their uh, livelihoods and nature around them, uh, or against the fundamental structures of oppression, inequality, and unsustainability, whether it's capitalism or it's state domination, it's much older patriarchy, racism, in India, casteism. And also, of course, this, the sort of notion that human beings rule the earth and we are at the center of the universe and therefore we can do whatever we want. And when these resistance movements happen, for instance, this particular one that you see in this image here is from about 30 years back, uh, indigenous uh, movement in central India against two mega hydroelectricity dams. And they were arguing that we are not going to allow these dams to come up, not only because they will displace us and displace us, but because this river is our mother and we will not allow our mother to be shackled by your, uh, your, your dream, as in the government and economists. And so you see in these resistance movements, alternative ways of being, of knowing, of doing, of dreaming, of acting. And so so-called development is not the only kid in town. There are lots of others and we need to pay attention to them. And we see this in uh, civil disobedience movements, resistance movements all over the world. Uh, the most amazing farmers movement that's been going on for the last eight months in India on the streets in, uh, in and around Delhi, 
the anti-racism movements in North America, the peace movements in Myanmar, Burma, the uh, climate justice movements by youth all over the world, the movement for democratization of the constitution in Chile, and many, many others. You see these notions, these alternative worldviews that are emerging. And why it's very important to actually recognize this as an alternative is because they are also telling us that unless we challenge the fundamental structures, we are going to fall into the traps, which Nemo spoke about, of the false or superficial solutions that the system is giving us. Uh, whether you know there used to be red, red plus, now there's net zero, there's net no loss, there's of course also sustainable development. And maybe in the discussion we can get into this because a lot of people seem to think the sustainable development goals are the most fantastic things that have happened to the earth. There's too many internal contradictions in it, including the fact that one of the goals is economic growth. And there's no way, as Nimna has said, there's no way you can actually have sustainability if growth is going to be at the basis of, uh, of well-being. Along with resistance, though, we also need, and there are uh, thousands and thousands of constructive alternatives, ways by which people are meeting their needs for food, for energy, for water, for housing, for uh, stay in decision making, for gender justice, for health, for alternative learning and education, etc. Uh, obviously, we don't have the time to go into many of these uh, in the short space. Uh, I will point later on to this book in which Nimo is also an author in which there's more than 100 examples of these which you can you can uh, get hold of uh, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll put in the chat box where you can get hold of it. Um, and also, by the way, uh, before I switch to the next one, I love this map. A lot of people, when I show this map, say, why is it upside down? And it gets us into this conversation of when were the maps that we, we think of as normal actually made? They were mostly made during colonial periods and they were made for Europe to be on top and to be shown as much bigger than it actually is. You can see here that in fact, Africa is so much bigger than, than, than uh, Europe. And um, if the planet is round, there's no reason why Africa cannot be on top. Why does Europe always have to be on top? So these are, these are many different ways in which we can decolonize our, our, our uh, you know, everyday experience of, of, of language, of maps, of, of culture and so on. Now, just to quickly go through a few examples, that I have found very inspiring. This is from uh, Southern India, uh, a group of about 5,000 uh, Dalit women farmers. For those of you who know the, who know the Indian caste system, Dalits are the so-called outcasts or untouchables, a very large number of people who have been marginalized and oppressed for a long, long, long time. And as women also, they're oppressed in patriarchy. Over the last 25 to 30 years, this group of people in about 75 villages has asserted itself, brought back its traditional diversity of seeds, switched completely to organic, biologically diverse farming, uh, shared a lot of its experiences, worked as a collective rather than as individual farmers, asserted their role as, as women, um, and so on and so forth, and completely transformed their lives from one of hunger and malnutrition to one of not just food security, but food sovereignty. And this is a very important distinction that they make because food security is I have enough to eat, but I'm dependent on the government. Food sovereignty is where I am in control of everything to do with my food. My, my community is in control. And the agroecological movement all over the world uh, is, is arguing for that. In fact, if you look at all the way across the world in Peru, in the highlands of the Andes, you find the Quechua indigenous people doing something very similar. They have complete control over the entire biocultural landscape. This is where the potato originated. They grow more than 1,300 varieties of potato, and they have asserted their biocultural rights to that landscape, to, to the potato varieties, etc. In both of these cases, incidentally, in India and Peru, uh, the same farmers, considered to be poor, illiterate, etc., etc., were providing relief materials during the COVID pandemic to those who didn't have enough food in nearby towns. Now, that's the that's the amazing transformations that have happened. A third one is. Uh, is from uh, Western Central Asia. This is the world's most conflict-ridden zone for a long, long time, the area between Turkey, Iran, Iraq, and Syria. And the Kurdish ethnic community there has tried to create a very large re uh, uh, region of autonomy based on eco-feminist principles in the middle of the most militarized area 
and a Vedic patriarchal society. So you can imagine the struggles that they're having to go through. And yet, uh, in the last 25 years, at least, they're showing possibilities of a very localized, very radical form of ecological, eco-feminist based democracy based on their own ideology, what they call genealogy, which is a women or a feminist kind of an ideology. Go further north to Europe, a few examples of what is called the social and solidarity economy. Um, one on the bottom right hand side is where a factory has been taken over completely by the workers, uh, not by capitalist owner, and they have converted into a totally democratically run factory. And amazingly, every worker is paid exactly the same amount of money for one hour of work, regardless of what the work is. So it's democratization of the political space as also the economic space. On the top left hand, uh, top right hand side is, is an example of what's called time banking, where people in the midst of an extremely capitalist uh, society are sharing their time, their, their expertise, their re human resources with each other without charging any money. So that in fact, people can live, even poor people can live high quality of life because they don't necessarily need uh, money for everything that they require. I don't have the time to go into the other examples, but alternative currencies, other kinds of social solidarity centers. And the last example I'll give, and this relates also, I think, to the issue of politics with harmony. Seeing power as not power to dominate, but power to do good. Power with and power to rather than power over. And you see this movement of feminist municipalism in some cities in Europe, uh, where in fact, uh, women mayors, for instance, in Barcelona, are arguing that we need to completely change the kind of politics we're doing. We need to work with each other. We need to work with the grassroots neighborhood assemblies on the ground and be responsive to them. Also, we need to work with opposition parties rather than be in constant hostility. And this might also relate to one of the questions that I think Andy had posed about uh, contestation. So let me end uh, the next two, three minutes by just talking about the kind of framework of transformation that is emerging out of these and hundreds of other examples. So there's a sort of transformation taking place in five spheres of life, of course, interconnected, the political, the economic, the social, the cultural, and the ecological. And I mean, I'm not going to go into all of these, we don't have the time. And at the core of this, what we call the flower of transformation is a set of ethics, principles and values, which I'll come to in a minute. Just to very quickly give you a glimpse of the kind of transformations, democracy, the original meaning of the word is power of the people. It's not power of those we elect or power of the bureaucrats. Uh, it, is about, it is about us claiming power inherent to us wherever we are to be part of decision making in our urban assemblies, uh, neighborhoods, in, in village assemblies, in our education institutions, in our NGOs, wherever we are, the flattening of power which in fact is very much possible as seen in the Kurdish Rozawa movement and many others. Um, the second is, of course, this, this cannot be successful unless also people have control over economy, the economy, uh, over production and consumption. So worker-owned production, economy of caring and sharing rather than everything being seen in monetary uh, terms. And so that also means we have to throw out uh, GDP as a indicator of well-being of any kind. It is not. It's a nonsensical uh, indicator and to bring in qualitative indicators. You know, do people have enough good qualitative food, quality food? Do they have clean water to drink? Do they have clean air? Do they have good social relationships? Are there are good opportunities for learning and health and so on. Um, and therefore, then the localization of the economy, much greater self reliance by the communities for at least the basic needs. All of this has to go hand in hand with struggles for equality because we do have both traditional and modern. Uh, inequalities of various kinds, gender, caste, classism, uh, class, uh, race, etc. So those things also, the struggles for that also are important. And uh, fourth is that of sustaining, reviving, encouraging the diversity of knowledges and cultures rather than the sort of hegemonic uh, modern, Western modernization, which has tried to impose saying the only worthwhile knowledge is modern science and technology and everything else is outmoded and primitive, or rather than, for instance, in India saying that English is or Hindi or whatever is the only language worth knowing, and all the other 780 languages are worthless. Now we have to be able to assert that diversity. Finally, this is something that Nimo has already spoken about eloquently, is to bring back the relationship we have 
with and within nature. Again, Western modernity has told us the left-hand side picture there, which is that human beings are at the top of the evolutionary uh, pyramid, whereas indigenous peoples and local communities have said, no, we're just one out of hundreds or millions of species. And so the humility that is needed to be part of that circle of life is what has to come back into our lives. Uh, so uh, lastly, as I said, at the core of that flower of transformation is a set of values. Uh, Nemo has emphasized harmony and, and reciprocity and many others. Uh, there's a lot of others. The examples I've given you emphasize the commons, the collective rather than privatization and individual selfishness. Uh, there's a stress on self-governance and autonomy, um, uh, but with responsibility, and I'll come to that in a minute from the Indian uh, perspective, there's not just human rights, but also the rights of the rest of nature, etc. So a whole bunch of values, which I think are completely in opposition to what the modern uh, dominant system, the current dominant system is telling us. And that also means that fundamental changes are needed in the education system, because that's where values are learned, right? In our families and in our schools. And so this is how do we bring these values into the uh, education system becomes an important part of it. So finally, uh, in terms of the sorts of worldviews that are either coming back from the past or emerging in the new context, uh, from India, we one of the things we call is Swaraj. Swaraj is self-rule uh, and autonomy and freedom, but with responsibility towards other people's uh, autonomy and freedom. Um, so, and this is a very important thing that this is a very deep notion of democracy that we're talking about here and responsibility toward others also includes other species. So it's a very simple concept. We all claim and have power to take decisions, but we take it with responsibility towards other people and other species. And there are similar notions in so many parts of the world. Uh, Nimmo in fact told me one from Nigeria the other day, I've forgotten it. He can tell us again once I finish but there's from South America, from so many parts of, uh, of Africa, uh, from many other, including from the global South in the industrialized countries. Also coming from within the industrial world, notions like degrowth, uh, ecofeminism, etc. As an aside, by the way, I should say that there's a tendency to think of all alternative worldviews as degrowth. That's a huge mistake. We should try and avoid that. It's an alternative worldview emerging from a particular context in, in industrial Europe uh, and is very relevant, but that doesn't mean that it is the only approach. And so when we're trying to emerge from COVID, it's not just talking about a Green New Deal, which is now the buzzword in America and Europe, but sort of multiple different revolutions, I would, what I would call a rainbow New Deal, emerging from the movements of people themselves and trying to bring those together. And it's a bringing together thing that we, uh, for which we started, uh, initiated this global tapestry of alternatives a couple of years back. Nemo and his organization are also part of this, of trying to create a, a sort of a platform of horizontal weaving, bringing a lot of these movements together to learn from each other across cultures, across languages, across geographies, create more of a critical mass for the macro uh, global changes that we need, building bridges between resistance movements and constructive alternatives, and collective dreaming and visioning of the kind of world that we want. Uh, this book I already mentioned to you, it's available now in two or three languages, two rivers, with a hundred examples of uh, alternatives from different parts of the world. Uh, and the one on the left is um, an interesting exercise we did of dreaming India in 2100, along all the different axes, health, education, conservation, indigenous peoples, et cetera, et cetera. And then coming back to her and saying, okay, what are the pathways of getting to that kind of a utopian vision? Just some takeaways for especially young people who might be listening. Uh, and by young, I don't necessarily mean by age only, uh, is that I think what we're seeing also in many parts of the world is youth are standing up and challenging established authority. And this is something that is so very important. And that should also include challenging people like Nimo and me. Uh, and, uh, but also then the need to more deeply understand movement, the history of movements, the current relevance of movements, uh, the complexity of the ecological and social challenges that we face and, and, and the roots of those sorts of problems rather than kind of relying only on superficial understanding and solutions. 
to examine our own lifestyles, especially if we are part of the richer part of the earth and are, are, have uh, unsustainable ecological footprints. Um, and our organizations, our communities, our education institutions, whatever, wherever we are, to look at our own patterns of production and consumption and to create alliances across boundaries because a lot of nation state boundaries are dividing us completely artificially. We have to challenge them and to create these alliances and who better to do it but, uh, but youth groups uh, across the world. Um, that's my email ID. You all can have it. I'll put it in the chat box later for uh, dialogue after this session. Stop sharing. Thank you. I hope I have not taken more, well, slightly more time than I should have. But uh, thanks a lot. Thank you, Ashish. Uh, for the it was, um, um, thank you for this session. Um, of course, I, I really have questions. But before we move to the Q&A, I would have um, Sarah respond to this because Anthony has so much to say, but Sarah, we have only five minutes. Sarah did a whole essay, Sarah Banani did a whole essay the last time um, um, Federico came here. Uh, so Sarah, this is not this is not for an essay, for just five minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, well thank you. Thank you, Adora. Thank you, Ashish. <laughs> um Many thanks for being here today, taking the time. I know you're very busy, so it's it's really, uh, I'm very deeply grateful that you took the time to talk to us today. Um, and for obviously the wonderfully rich talk. Uh, so many issues, I, I am, uh, I'm not sure how to respond, but I am going to try. I hope you'll bear with me because the, it, the, the whole panel, you know, the, it is way too much, way, way far beyond my capability, I think, to respond to uh, so many important issues that you've raised there. Um, and also, it is, of course, an honor for me to respond to your talk, uh, yet very daunting too. Uh, like thousands of uh, folks like me working on sustainability issues in India and, and around the world, um, you know, we, your writings and, and work with, with your organization, Kalpa Briksh, have been a huge source of inspiration for us. Um, and of course, we are all deeply in awe of you. So in, in, in that sense, to be here and, and to speak today is a major honor. Um, uh, Mike, I'm going to ask a few questions, Ashish, maybe try to limit to three, as I know Adora has already warned me that I have five minutes and I've already taken a minute out of that. So the first question, um, if I may start with, you talked about decolonization at some point in your, in your, you know, in your discussion today. And uh, I wonder, in relation to this, project, the larger project of decolonization, if development with the capital D that you began with, also then needs to be very centrally linked back to colonialism, coloniality, modernity that was put in place by colonialism, coloniality in different parts of the world, especially the post-colonial world. And if it can then be connected um, to modernity rather than capitalism or developmentalism or fascism or socialism, then it can span across all of those different forms in which societies have evolved, while at the same time embracing modernization and modernity and the coloniality that lies at the heart of it. Uh, I know at some point you also talked about modernity, so I had to, you know, I was writing this comment and then I had to, I had to change it back saying, yeah, but well, Ashish is talking about it. <laughs> well, but then I thought, and I heard something there too, you talked about Western. Um, now, obviously, growing up in India, I knew I grew up in a, in a very modern way. So I, I didn't think I was growing up in a Western modernity. I knew I was growing up, growing up in an Indian modernity. Similarly, people around the world grow up in many, many different forms of modernity. So to attach, locate modernity in the West now, in the 21st century, perhaps, you know, I, I, I often feel confused by that. Well, how can we call it Western when I myself and my uh, my forefathers especially have embraced it in a very big way uh, and other regions around the world. So is there another way then to talk about modernity, which points to a particular modes of relations and structures that lie behind so many of our catastrophes right now? So that's my first question. Second uh, question is related. You, you have this amazing, wonderful flower, which I am of course very jealous of. I wish I could have done such a great job of drawing all of those wonderful things and connecting them together in such nice ways. And at the end, uh, what was very interesting is that you also pointed to 
divides um, political, cultural, these divides that are also at the same time categories, you know, divides that the moderns asked us to, asked us to do, divide the economic from the social so that economic experts can govern that, right? You don't have a right to say anything what economists are doing. Divide the social from the political because there are other, some other experts will say and, you know, some other people will be left out of the process of what counts as social. Political, the same. Uh, technical, scientific, all these modern divides that have been constructed. I know you are connecting them, but isn't there also a risk in, in reproducing those divides through the flower? And I wondered why, whether you've thought about them, whether you consider that to be um, uh, perhaps um, a problem in some sense when, when thinking about decolonization in particular and moving beyond modernization as embedded inside development in particular. Um, uh, two very quick more questions, if I'm allowed. Uh, what's the time? Okay, one last question. I know my time's run out. So one last question, which is about you know the tapestry. Uh, amazing initiatives you pointed to around the world. Um, great local in, lo localization initiatives and other things, uh, currency and many many more. You pointed to cooperatives, but but you also talk about tapestry, right? Which you did not talk so much about today, but about linking them together, bringing them together somehow, seeing them somehow as being connected to each other in different ways. So could you maybe talk a little bit more about that linking and how that linking together um, can help us or not in asserting the value of diversity that you highlight? Thank you, Adora. Thank you, Ashish. Again, uh, uh, Thank you. It's been a great honor. You did a good job sticking to the time. Of course, you still, you still have to speak later. Um, so right now, actually to respond to that, and then we'll take questions from people here. Um, if you're on Zoom and you want to ask a question, you can just raise your hands up, and we'll also read out the questions in the chat box. So actually, if you just respond to um, Sora, and then we'll take, take questions from everyone, if that's fine. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks all of these are uh, actually extremely, uh, they sound simple, but they're extremely complex questions. So thanks for them. They, they, I mean, this kind of questioning actually gets us thinking because sometimes what tends to happen is that we get very, uh, we get so caught up in our own and language and so convinced with our arguments that, you know, uh, that's why I love talking to people like you, but also to uh, young students because they ask questions. We say, oh gosh, I sort of, imagine that this was the truth for the last 20 years and now this person is asking me a question that fundamentally challenges that which i think is very important um obviously uh, a response in a minute each is not going to be satisfactory of any kind uh, but maybe just to give a few hints of uh, what i think about the question so one is about the notion of uh, development modernity western etc yeah, I mean, I'm using short forms and I'm using uh, sometimes cliches, but that's because of the nature of this kind of a conversation, which is so time limited. Um, my problem is that, of course, if we use any notion whatsoever, we can say, say, industrial modernity or human centered modern anthropocentric modernity or Western modernity is what I, I used uh, uh, or uh, uh, developmentality as another way of looking at it or whatever. I mean, there's different terms that people have used is that they all turn out to be unsatisfactory at one way, one level or the other. None of them explain the complexity of what has happened in the last 500 years, right? Um, and especially since the so-called industrial revolution. So the, the shift from complexity thinking, which was so inherent in the way, for instance, indigenous peoples live their lives to uh, the kind of thinking that you see uh, over the last two, 300 years, uh, with with uh, with uh, certain modernity coming in from from Europe, especially in, in North America, uh, where you begin to sort of separate human beings from nature, you begin to so actually simplify and make simplistic, very complex systems, uh, do reductionist kind of thinking, et cetera, et cetera, all of that which you are familiar with. Uh, it's that which I'm talking about, and in that sense, your uh, parents and grandparents and my parents and grandparents having in a way got you know bought into it with maybe the best of intentions uh, doesn't mean that we have escaped that notion 
just because there's an Indianized version of that, for instance, right now, uh, and we can call it our own names, etc., doesn't mean we, mean we have fundamentally in any way challenged and altered that. The fundamental challenges to that come from what are our own roots of understanding? What are our own roots of looking at the rest of nature, of looking at each other, of looking within ourselves, of, of mind, heart, et cetera, et cetera. And especially the sort of um, non-binary ways of thinking that we've had in many traditional societies. I'm not, by the way, in any way, uh, romanticizing traditional societies and lots of problems, uh, as we know. But there were some, some of these inherent ways of kind of being and doing uh, and thinking and, and acting, which, which, uh, which were destroyed or displaced with these notions of modernity. And therefore, I think it's very fundamental to challenge that, which is not the same thing as challenging modern. I think we have to distinguish between modernity and modern. I mean, there are certain aspects of what's modern life, for instance, some of the human rights movements, for instance, that we might want to embrace. Uh, but let's interrogate all of that from, from certain fundamental ethics and principles and see what it is that, we, and, and this could be different in different parts of the world. And we'll come back to the issue of pluralism uh, again, maybe in the later discussion. Um, so I'm sorry, I, I, I can't think of any one satisfactory term for it. So it's very important to then be able to explain what one means and then be able to challenge that. On the, uh, on the categorization that's in the flower of transformation, absolutely. The only reason we do that is to make it understandable. It's a heuristic device. It's, a, it's an analytical device. And every time we use an example with it or we try and analyze uh, something using that, we are trying to emphasize the fact that, uh, uh, that, that these are not separable. You know, that the personal is the political, the political is the social, et cetera, et cetera, all of that. But yet I find at least that uh, uh, in a lot of circumstances, a lot of contexts that it's actually useful to be able to look at it in this sort of a way. Um, and there can be multiple other ways of, of doing it also. So if we get lost in this, in fact, the, uh, one of the ways in which we started was to say these are five pillars, the political, the economic, and almost immediately people pointed out, hey, listen, pillars are separate. There's no interconnection. So that's when we then started drawing the circles. And we find that as we draw the circles, the intersections actually start getting bigger and bigger and bigger as we analyze any particular situation. Uh, and, and that we have to always emphasize. So that's a very valid point that you're making and not to fall into the binaries or the divisions that of course, um, many of us as academics or as government officers or whatever fall into. And especially to see it from the point of view of a person living a life in a village, for instance, they don't separate social, political, economic kind of thing. It's all, it's all integral. So I, I totally accept that. Um, and the third one about building the tapestry while uh, asserting uh, diversity, and I think maybe this also goes back to a point I think Andy made about pluralism and contention, um, is that uh, for us, what's important in the GTA and the global tapestry of alternatives is, is to take the Zapatista slogan of many worlds, uh, a world in which many worlds fit. Now, a world in which many worlds fit is about pluralism. It's about, that's why we call the book Pluriverse. Uh, Pluriverse. But there is an essential precondition to this, I think, even in the way the Apatista mean it. You can't have anything goes. Uh, you, you can't have, I don't think it's possible, for instance, for a capitalist system to coexist with others in this, in this one world. Because inevitably, at some point or the other, it's going to want to exploit, uh, if you see the inherent logic of capitalism, it will want to exploit some other world. And in, in which case, then it's undermining that world's uh, right to exist and flourish, right? So, so there's a certain base, uh, maybe that's the base of ethics and principles that I put out, which have to be followed. But beyond that, there'll be an incredible diversity, right? So now how do we build that tapestry is to recognize the diversity, but also this common, these common threads. So when we've been engaging in dialogue with say the indigenous peoples of uh, Peru or with the uh, Kurdish Rojava women uh, from, from Syria or Turkey or uh, with uh, European commons uh, movement or with African movements of, uh, you know, of uh, the kind that Nimo is uh, leading. Um, it is this attempt to try and not just recognize, but respect the diverse ways in which people are take, doing these movements, are seeing the world 
and then saying, okay, but what's common? So you saw today, for instance, in Nimo and I didn't uh, coordinate our presentations, but he spoke about roots, I spoke about radical, he spoke about harmony, I was speaking about solidarity, right? So you begin to see these commonalities and then how do you build uh, the bridges uh, and the cross-cultural learning and always, and that's my last comment, always i think giving ourselves the sense that none of us is trying to create this one overarching organization under which everybody will fit because that is a fatal flaw that has been there with a lot of networking but to, to recognize that we're all equal and so it's this horizontal weave that's why we call it tapestry a horizontal weave I mean, something like what you see behind me over there right uh, which everybody is able to participate thank you sorry adora i think my response was a bit longer than it should have been that's okay. <laughs> thank you. Um, I think we have a question. Someone's hand is up. I think we have a question. Um, okay. So, Akash, if I might ask the question. Yes, thank you, Adora. Um, thank you, Ashish, for that um, insightful uh, presentation. Thank you. Nemo and uh, uh, Stalin and uh, Aurora for the comments. Um, I like to talk about look at uh, the 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 presentations. I want to put them together. I mean, Bessie talked about uh, pathways of harmonies, and uh, Ashish, you talked about livelihoods to deadlihoods. And um, uh, Nemo, uh, sometime in June uh, on, on the World Environment Day, I was uh, asked the question of how the cleanup of uh, the Ogoni was going. And uh, I told my interviews, the guest, uh, the, the host on the TV show that it was, it's only Nemo that can answer to that question that I'm not on ground on the Niger Delta. And it seems interesting as, to how the Niger Delta have moved from livelihoods to deadlyhoods in terms of uh, the pollution uh, in the environment. And I would like to know what, what are the footpaths to harmony? How, how is the Niger Delta people, the civil society, exploring footpaths to having a, 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 the, the Niger Delta come uh, uh, into harmony with uh, the environment. And I want to make reference to the Penobscot Indian Nation people. I was, uh, I was up there in Maine some time ago and you could uh, appreciate how the Wabanakis uh, have regained democracy and the decolonization that has happened with the capitalist um, uh, structure and the power conflicts between the state of Maine and the Indian nation people. How possible is it, uh, Nemo, for uh, Niger Delta or other communities around the world to own their communities, to, to, to have control over the environment? I think that can only be when uh, there, there will be pathways, uh, footpaths to harmony and when livelihoods can actually be livelihoods and not move transit from livelihoods to deadlyhoods. Thank you very much. Thank you. Nemo or Ashish, do you want to respond to this? This one was specifically to Nemo, so Nemo, go ahead. Well, um, <laughs> Akachibu put me on the spot. Um, and asked a very difficult, well, you didn't ask the question, but you did ask without asking the question about what is going on with the Ogoni cleanup. And uh, I've been very circumspect speaking about that cleanup. Uh, it's a very contradictory system, uh, situation. Uh, for those who don't know, in 2011, the United Nations Environment Program published a report on the assessment of Ogoni environment. Ogoni is the hometown of the late Kensal Awiwa, who was executed by the Nigerian state in November 1995, uh, because he campaigned against environmental pollution and loss of livelihoods of the people. 
And actually, right from that time, the Ogoni and the entire Nigeria had already become, they've moved from livelihoods to deadlyhoods. Uh, thanks to Ashis for that time. I've never heard it before. Um, so, um, so today, the, the cleanup actually, the report was issued in 2011. Uh, a body was set over in 2012 to handle the cleanup or never took off, except by placing signposts in the community for people to keep up the environment. Um, another body was revamped in 2016, uh, five years after the report had been published. And this body actually began to clean up some minor, some areas with minor pollution, less complex locations. And they left the more complex locations for the second phase of the cleanup. And right now at the moment, they just awarded contracts for provision of alternative drinking water, which is what should have been done as an emergency action at the beginning. Uh, so, so we have a lot of a lot of movement, but a lot of motion, but very little movement on the ground. Uh, so I don't know where I hope that answered the question. Um, even if the, the area is cleaned up in five years, it will require a lifetime for the area to get back to something close to normal. Uh, because environmental remediation is not the same as environmental restoration. We, we learned from the Alaska situation, the zone Valdez pollution in Alaska that occurred in 1989, that up to maybe even now and up to recently, when I last checked, a certain life forms, species that were lost to that pollution are yet to fully return to that region. Uh, so right now we are in the very desperate situation where the entire Nigeria experiences on the average about five oil spills every day, uh, and this is going on by for, for so many reasons from different sources. And uh, so restoring that environment will probably take more than one lifetime. This is why it is very urgent right now to, to, to begin the cleanup. So the question you asked, well, how is civil society and the communities exploring footpaths to harmony? Uh, this is actually, um, this is what the communities have been doing for ages because communities are living very close to the environment. The culture is about the environment, the livelihoods, everything, their songs, their stories, everything's about the environment that they, they're insisting on. The resistance has been ways of advocating to go back to, to restore the harmony. Um, this has been very difficult as you well know. Uh, many people have lost their lives in peaceful demonstration. And then with the environment is actually eating the people up, swallowing the people up. So part of the restoration, I, I believe, some of the experimentation that we are doing now with the community people is to collect the stories of the resistance, the stories of imagination of the life the people want and the struggles they are going through right now. Uh, it's by, I, I firmly believe that um, is when we understand our stories, it's possible to build connections uh, and building connection, building solidarity would put us on the pathways to this harmony we are talking about. And one of the key tools or key uh, concepts for us is resource democracy, resource with a hyphen between the re and the source, resource democracy, which means reconnecting to nature, which means living with nature, living the good life and not as Ashish mentioned, not me life measured with GDP and all such uh, indices. It means having the right to self-determination. In a country like Nigeria, self-determination is something that raises uh, political temperature so high. And people don't even want to talk about it, but we can't run away from it. Eventually, everybody must have the right to determine their destiny, uh, either to live in harmony with nature, with their neighbors, and how this will be done. Uh, that's where we are right now. And I, I hope that scratches part of the question you asked. It does, thank you. <laughs> I think Ashish wanted to respond as well. Uh, not to that, I was looking at the questions in the chat uh, on, on the issue of scale. So at some point I can respond to that. Okay, we'll get back to the chat. And I want to see if anyone in the room had a question. Anyone? No question here. Okay. I have a question because I want the clarification about food sovereignty because I'm a bit confused about uh, how can I differentiate uh, from food 
and also my total meeting because uh, what I understand is at first glance it said that anyone can have the right to have the access of vote what they want. But if it's like that, uh, you know, uh, I'm from Bangladesh, we have some kind of uh, problems like if I have this, this kind of right, there will be some kind of negative impact in that because as I have the right to store food, so as I want them, uh, I will get some kind of, uh, you know what, uh, uh, I will take more than I need, then it will uh, uh, just create some kind of scarcity in the market. <clears throat> I think I want to uh, understand it uh, very clearly so that I can differentiate it if it's a good or bad, at least for my country. <laughs> Um, I think the question is for Ashish. There's someone in the room who wants to get, who wants a clear um, difference or a clear uh, definition or difference, disparity between food security and food sovereignty. And food sovereignty because she doesn't get it completely. And she says she's from Bangladesh, so she needs to know if it's good or bad. Yeah. Should I respond? Yeah. Yeah, okay, thanks for, thanks for the question. I'm sorry I didn't get the name of the person who asked. But uh, uh, so, firstly, the difference between food security and food sovereignty, and then I'll get to your question of what happens if people misuse uh, that uh, control or that power. So, the difference is as, as follows that food security is where, like, India has a Food Security Act, which uh, makes the government accountable to make sure that everybody has enough food, right? Um, uh, and of course, we know that with the kind of inefficiencies and, and corruption and lack of uh, care, etc., that is there for in most governments, probably all governments, uh, especially when you're thinking of a country as big as India, um, or the lack of capacity, that that is simply not going to be possible, uh, the, making the government accountable for it. And in any case, what it does is it makes, uh, if I'm a farmer or a consumer, I'm always dependent on somebody else for the food. Uh, if it's an if it's the food security model, the food sovereignty model is where farmers are saying, and this is a huge movement all over the world. If you look at, for instance, La Via Campesina, uh, the world's largest social movement of uh, small farmers, they are arguing that we need full control over the means of growing food, right? So that means control over our land, over the water, uh, the knowledge, and the seeds and anything else that goes into the growing of food. Um, this should not be in the control of either private corporations or the government. Why should the government have a law where seeds are its property? Or why should corporations be coming into our agriculture where Monsanto or whoever else is actually controlling our lives? We are the ones who should be in control because we are the ones who are producing it. We are the workers on the land. And so that is uh, food sovereignty where you're actually moving towards that kind of independence, autonomy, self-determination, the word that Nemo used, right? Now, this does not give us the right to exploit the situation. It, uh, it, that, that's not part of the movement at all. Food sovereignty is, like I said with Swaraj, that it's about our rights to self-determine and autonomy, but with responsibility towards others, which means that if my so food sovereignty is going to undermine yours, that's not part of the value system at all. That's not what people are arguing, or not what the agroecological movement around the world is arguing. So uh, the, the dangers of that kind of thing you're talking about, of people holding off food and then maybe selling it only when the price goes very high, etc. That's what traders do. Very few farmers, very few small farmers will ever do this. Uh, they don't have that kind of a value system of maximizing their profits. Uh, and in any case, they maybe don't even have the means to do it. Traders typically are the ones who actually do this. And we're not asking, we're not talking about food sovereignty for traders. <laughs> we're talking about the producers, the workers, the small peasants, especially. Um, but this also relates to, of course, uh, land relationships, the unequal distribution of land, the unequal distribution of the power and control over seeds, uh, who controls water. In a lot of countries, uh, water is, is uh, governed by the government and is not in the control of local communities. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So there are many different sort of transformations that are entailed within the food sovereignty movement. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Ashish. Um, I think we just 
And incidentally, this is a movement also not just for food. People are arguing for water sovereignty, energy sovereignty, basically saying that we need to be in control of the basic needs of our life and not be dependent on somebody outside. Even as we make governments accountable, but for basic needs, we should have as much independence and autonomy as possible. Next question. Uh, Sanjay, you there was the one question on scale. Yeah, there are a couple of questions in there. Um, oh. So, <clears throat> one of the questions was from Michael Anderman, and he is asking um, one of the key problems of climate change and social inequalities in the world is their huge scale and the urgency to address them. All the examples of communities and other groups of people taking sustainability to their hands are awful. But how do we scale them up massively to turn them into a new mainstream? To me, central governments have to implement tougher and more conscious policies, many at international levels, aimed at controlling consumption, and with that, seriously confronting current corporate practices. But how do you do that at the same time without falling into authoritarianism? And how can you achieve such a balance? Yeah, I, I, I could do that and I'm sure Nima will also have things to say about it. So I think on the issue of scale, what I've been saying is that uh, there are two notions that are, that are faulty. Uh, one is upscaling. So you have a successful example somewhere, like the examples that I gave, and then you say, okay, how do we make it bigger and bigger and bigger? It's, very, it's a very corporate way of looking at it. Sometimes even NGOs want to do that, right? just get bigger and bigger and create their own empires. Uh, nor are we talking about replicating. How do we replicate this success? It's not about replication, not about copying something somebody has done and doing in my place, because my place is different. My, my soil might be different. My ecology ecosystems might be different. My cultures might be different, etc. What we argue for is outscaling, which means to learn the processes that successful initiative has used the principles, the, the, the how did it overcome hurdles, what, what were the key lessons learned from it, and then apply it in our own context with whatever modifications are necessary. And this is why this tapestry is so, so very important because you then create the possibility of people being able to learn from each other without the so-called replication and without the upscaling, which just creates centralization, right? So if, if, uh, if this is the thing that you have a decentralized way of creating more and more and more and more such solutions, then the scaling is created by networking them, by linking up with each other. So instead of one humongous corporate 10 million hectares of organic farming, which is what many of the corporations want to get into now, you actually talk about 2 million farmers creating on their own local uh, uh, land holdings, organic farming, and then linking up as a federation or many, many different federations, right? Uh, and so maintaining some level of uh, horizontality and, uh, and, and democracy. Now, when one does that, then one also creates the critical mass for affecting the policy changes. And so until, an, uh, uh, I mean, till governments exist and the state exists, whether the state should exist or not is, is a separate question. I won't get into it. But until the state is there and there are, there are governments in place, we need to then also, of course, argue for shifts in policy away from regressive policies to progressive policies. For instance, in India, uh, uh, mo you know, I think something like 100 billion rupees is spent on subsidizing chemical fertilizers. And the organic farming move is, movement is saying, if you at all want to subsidize, shift all of that into organic subsidies. And eventually do away with that because food sovereignty doesn't need subsidies in any case. But maybe in the short run, it would help in, in making that transformation possible. So progressive policies would then significantly enhance the possibility of spreading these successful examples. But they need to be not top down. They need to be not where government says, okay, yeah, yeah, we will give you subsidy or uh, support for organic farming, but you have to do it in the way we say, or you have to set up this kind of committee and you have to do this and we will certify it and we'll, et cetera, et cetera, not like that. But simply to say, okay, here's enabling environment for spreading these successful initiatives. If government's not willing to do that, 
at the very least we must demand that they do away with regressive policies policies which make people having to swim against the tide if they want to create these successful initiatives that's the very least we must do uh, for any of these things whether it's climate or it's agriculture or or any or any anything like this so that's how i would look at the uh, issue of scale and we have many 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 examples of where this kind of outscaling and networking has created a much larger uh, arena for transformation than only individual small scale initiatives might do thank you um we got to start again um i think michael does that answer your question just to be sure i don't know if he's still on the um i would assume that this answers michael's question and B. E. Farrow, I think he has also left a call for well, his question. He also related to that that he has been answered. Um, because if I had a question and I think Nemo responded, um, I'm interested in the call. Do we have any other questions? Yes, we need another question. Yeah. Um, so, one thing that I question is, um, with that, not a question per se, it's a challenge is how urbanism can be. So, a lot of people are moving into cities, and cities are great big places where it's easy to feel disconnected from because there's so many people going around, and you might move different parts of the city, it's very hard to get communities built. So, how can we build toward these kind of get these deep roots and have the harmony that we, you guys have been talking about whilst also we are? Moving into larger and larger and larger cities that are feeling more and more disconnected. Yes, um, uh, that, that's a very interesting point. Um, the, 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 the short answer I have for that is uh, there's this story about someone in the Middle East who was talking about the fact that the grandfathers rode on camels now they ride it. then they later they rode on motorbikes and then rode on cars so eventually in future you're going to go back to the camel uh, so uh, moving to big cities is not inevitable because we're going to get to a point where the big cities will become relics of a failed civilization uh, and uh, uh, this is why actually it's urgent for us to reimagine the way we live the kind of connections we make, the kind of futures we are constructing. Um, otherwise, we have a lot of monuments, just like the way we look at the pyramids today, pyramids in Egypt, uh, the pyramids in Latin America, the ziggurats and all those structures. You just wonder, how would you build a pyramid just to bury one person or just to have one king have a place that you lay his bones in? It, it made sense when it was done. To, in future, we we'll look at the Asher, people will look at skyscrapers and they wonder what with what were these people ever thinking of? They would look at the aircraft and so on and say, where, where were they flying to? Uh, and so the big cities are inevitably going to collapse and become villages, except we learn to live within the bounds of nature. Thank you. Ashley, do you have to respond? Yeah, just a quick uh, uh, response also. Uh, I love that uh, imagery demo. Uh, I think it would be great. Uh, uh, Somebody needs to do a science fiction novel using that. Uh, the uh, and a lot of science fiction does come true. So you know, it's, it's, I don't know if any of you, by the way, as a, as an aside, if any of you has read uh, the Ministry for the Future, it's a science fiction book by uh, uh, Kim Stanley Robinson. It's amazing. It's brilliant because there's lots of very hardcore climate science in it, but also lots of very interesting and adventurous uh, fiction. But which kind of encompasses possible ways by which by 2040 or 2045, the world would have transformed pretty significantly uh, towards being much more climate responsible. So take a look at it if you haven't. Uh, but on, this, on the issue of cities, I think uh, I totally agree with Nemo that there's nothing inevitable about uh, cities or urbanization. Right now, it seems as if all the world is going to be living in cities. But in fact, even in, in India, though it's still peripheral, we're actually beginning to see that where villages are revitalized, uh, like some of the examples that I was giving, 
then people not only not move out but in fact many cases people are moving back to the villages because they find a a lively much more equitable and uh, economically uh, uh, you know uh, uh, remunerative or sort of satisfying life back in their own village this has happened where crafts have revived this has happened where agriculture has become much better people have moved back because they don't necessarily find the good way of living within the city at all right and in the covid pandemic it's very interesting the millions of people who had to go back to villages many of them are asking this question we don't want to go back to the city and live and live that undignified life if only we had opportunities in the village and that's the big big uh, challenge for all of us including the policy challenge how do we create those opportunities so that this thing of cities become bigger and bigger and bigger simply doesn't uh, make sense anymore and, and doesn't happen and the second thing is that yeah well towns will still exist i'm not sure nimo that everything will become cities uh, will become villages towns will still exist but on a much smaller scale and there the movement of recommoning that you see in many cities of the world bringing back the private space it is into common spaces you know throwing out the cars from a parking lot and making it into an urban garden or an urban agricultural plot you can see that happening in so many cities in in the world uh, that kind of recommoning the uh, reimagining of the cities as a space as spaces that are uh, uh, poss- where dignity is possible where you can have fearless living where you don't you can say, you know your kids can go out and play without being afraid of getting knocked off uh, knocked on the cars reimagining the streets to be much more pedestrian and cyclist friendly reimagining the planning of the city so that you don't actually have to go 20 kilometers for work every day your work is you know close to your own neighborhood etc cetera, etc cetera. that's the kind of rethinking that is happening for cities the transition town town movements the commons movements many of them are trying to sort of rethink what the city itself uh, could or should look like and many interesting uh, practical initiatives along those lines also so i think it's this twin thing of revitalizing the villages and reimagining what the urban space could look like that becomes very important okay thank you um i think we have another question Um, just last thing, what are your thoughts on degrowth? Um, degrowth is a very controversial topic, and for this, I, I think um, we both need one actually to respond, and I would also think Andy and Sarah will respond to this as well. Uh, so, what are your thoughts on degrowth? This is from George. Okay. Um, yes, uh, I'll give a short uh, response to that. And, and maybe something else I saw on the chat about the food sovereignty and seeds. Um, just to mention that food sovereignty actually uh, would, would, uh, depends also on having seed sovereignty. You have the right to save your seed, share your seed, produce your seed the way that is not artificial or based on chemical chemicals and something that is culturally Uh, appropriate so that 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 works that works that way that's one of the things that can be considered in that uh degrowth um what do i say about that I, um I, i think the concept of degrowth really uh pertains to is the realization that we've already almost exceeded collectively exceeded we're collectively exceeding planetary limits Uh, on almost all fronts and it means pulling the brakes on certain linearity that just pushing things on a straight line uh believing that growth can keep going going and, and it all depends on the, the notion of what is the good life what is uh what is progress uh what is growth what is development uh and you know if we don't redefine those concepts uh will be going in a way that uh, would not, will, of course, will take us beyond the tip, tipping point. But the growth requires that we look at all this, look at uh, our lifestyles, consumption. You have to keep producing things uh, for just for the sake, advertise for the sake of consumption, whether people need it or not. And we have to keep on mining, mining, uh, extracting resources, extracting minerals, even when you don't need them. For, uh, for example, I don't, a lot of us believe that 
enough gold have been mined already. So why do you still mining gold? What are you using it for? Just to put them in the vaults as a measure of value. What value are you measuring? measuring? Uh, and of course, the need for the world has agreed that we should move away from fossil fuels, but still corporations and politicians are looking for new reserves. Uh, so very contradictory. Deep growth means that we, we stop and think and curtail our appetites for continuous consumption and destruction. And I think we, we can't run away from it. We may debate the concept. There are different ways to define the concept. Uh, we don't have to, we can't apply it uniformly across the world. Because some people will now ask you now, we could ask you, you've got to a certain point. You don't want me to get there. Some people are, are looking for ways to achieve what others, something that others have gotten to. And my question always is, if somebody in my village wants to be, uh, for example, want to build Buckingham Palace, uh, my question would be, who are you going to colonize? And whose territory are you going to, going to pack things from? Who are you going to, to plunder, for example? And if you want to be like certain other places, who are you going to enslave to achieve that? So there, there, there are a lot, of, a lot of things to consider when we talk about the growth. Uh, but generally, uh, I, I believe that it just calls us to reflect on where we are and where we're going and why we can't continue the way we're going. You. Over to you, Ashes. Yeah, um, so agreeing with what uh, Nimo has just said, I think in a general way, absolutely uh, degrowth makes sense. Uh, where I think it's problematic as a term, not, not the sort of thinking behind it, but as a term is in, and I'm, uh, in countries like many of ours, for instance, uh, where the the, the word itself is going to be is going to face a lot of hostility, uh, and not just from governments. We're talking about from ordinary people, right? Uh, people who have aspirations for people who don't have enough right now to eat, or don't have enough to to clothe themselves, or don't have houses, etc. And so, uh, we, what we need to do is to actually talk about different notions which are kind of similar to degrowth, but which are also emanating from one's own culture and one's own. Uh, sort of roots, right? So this is why we talk about this blue rivers, in which degrowth is one of the approaches. It's emerged from a certain, as I said earlier, it's a certain industrial uh, context in which there's been way too much material and energy uh, growth, uh, you know, for anybody's good. Um, but if you were to say that, okay, how does degrowth in Europe, let's say, uh, align with Swaraj in India, with uh, uh, Ubuntu and and uh, again going back to the word ete what was it uh, Nemo I keep forgetting your eti uven eti uven uh, in Nigeria uh, and many others and and then to sort of approach it because that also makes it more palatable for people you know when when you when you approach it in one's own idiom or language or context and you know and not say oh, uh, this is you know everything is degrowth or everything is X Y Z. Uh, it makes it much more acceptable, much more palatable, much more exciting. Yeah. So that's my only problem with the word, uh, not with the movement. I have lots of great friends in the degrowth movement. Um, and, and that's why sometimes uh, many of us tend to, to use, if you want some sort of an umbrella term to kind of, in English, then to, coin, to either say post-growth or post-development. Because that then can encompass a whole lot of different things. And it's not, it's not an anti-word. It's like, okay, how are we going beyond it? Um, and sometimes that becomes easier than to articulate, argue for, and then within that you can say, okay, in my context, this is what it means. Uh, so yeah, that's my response to that. And, and I've been telling my European friends that please don't colonize us with another one of your terms. You mm -hmm. already did it with development. Now in a, uh, with the best of intentions, don't do it with, with the growth. I say it half jokingly, but uh, it's important. Ashish, didn't you recently run a whole session on how degrowth is Eurocentric? Yeah, 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 yeah. We we had a we had a session on on that. So yeah, that's so I, I mean I, I say it softly and gently because you know, as I said, they're all good friends in the degrowth moment. But it is important to point this out. And this is partly our fault also. I mean, I'm talking about say from India and Africa. We tend to think something coming from Europe must be good. You know, it's come from the white land. So it must surely be good. Uh, that's how we've accepted all the development stuff. And now we're accepting some of the alternatives also. So we really have to 
softly and gently assert ourselves. Um, sir, I'm, thank you, Ashish. Sir, I'm, I'm, I'm good. Andy, I'm, I'm, oh, I have another one. I think Ash, Ashish and Dimo said you're all on, on the deep road okay. point, but I did have another question. Wait, sir. Yeah, after, 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 does I want to say anything? Okay, Andy has another question, then we can take. Okay, no, take the other question first. That's okay. good. Let's go. Yeah, and my name is Ritik. I I came in 19 years in financial services before uh, keeping up that and switching over pivoting slowly into something more meaningful. So my world has been finance and I've uh, been making rich with Jeff. Now that primarily was my objective for the last 19 years, and I found how meaningless it was. I'm truly privileged to be in the company of people who have a colossal impact on you know, what we're seeing, witnessing today. So I'm really privileged. My question to the panel is around the narrative, because uh, even as we speak about climate change and some of the conversation, the narratives are pretty much still guided by capitalists and capitalism and companies and corporations. When they choose to make that a subject in Davos, that gets discussed at the top. When that gets chosen as a G7 topic, then it gets discussed in a certain way that the narrative then flows out. So much so, embarrassingly, we call ourselves save the planet. Where the planet is fine, self-sufficient, it's actually the humans who need to save, right? And that narrative needs to be shaped through what? Facebook, Google, which is again the corporates who are making the trillions. So how do we get out of this almost concentric vortex of media, propaganda, narratives which actually take us away from saving humans. Thank you, um, Matthew, for your question. Uh, Ashley Shalimo, did you get the question? Nemo, you going first? Perfect. Okay, Nimo is uh, smiling. Uh, okay, let me have a go at it and then Nimo can add. So, uh, uh, yeah, I think the, you know, uh, this is what we were also kind of talking about when we, were talk when we mentioned the sort of false solutions uh, narratives that we're, that we're getting with carbon trading and sustainable development. I mean, if you look at it, the, the biggest uh, buzzword now is sustainable development, right? The SDGs, everybody's wanting to implement the SDGs, including most NGOs in the world. Um, so uh, that that does tend to happen where the money is or where the, where the, the power is, is, is what the narrative that, that uh, tends to, to rule and which then rules our lives. Um, but I, I, I think we're also seeing a lot of counter narratives and it's up to us to enhance and promote them and link them up. So going back to degrowth, I mean, in Europe, there's no way, absolutely no way in which degrowth, and that's one of the powers of the term, by the way, powerful item uh, aspects of the term is that there's no way that a capitalist corporation can co-opt the word degrowth. Uh, yeah, uh, and, and we can do that with so many of our other terms also. Uh, many of our terms are possible to co-opt. Uh, Swaraj can be co-opted. Boen Vivir has been co-opted by the governments of Ecuador and Bolivia and so on. But because they've emerged from people's own movements and struggles, they're possible to rescue and to assert that this is actually what it means, not what you guys are talking about. So these counter narratives constantly have to be brought out and we should not be following the dictates or the, uh, the pace or whatever it is of whether it's the G7 or it's the tech giants of the world. Um, so it's not simply because now G7 is talking about climate that we should also be talking about climate. If you look at it, in fact, climate, uh, the climate argument was, was made initially by indigenous peoples 30 years back that something is happening to the world, to the climate, right? Um, nobody listened to them, but if you go back into it, you'll find that. Uh, or by people like uh, Edward Goldsmith, the editor of The Ecologist, started speaking about his was The Ecologist was probably the first 
global magazine to talk about climate crisis. This is 30 years back or 25 years back. Right? So the narrative started there. It's just that these guys have taken it over and then suddenly now everybody's saying climate, climate, climate. So we have to constantly be able to reassert our narratives, maybe if need be find new terms or rescue the old terms from the way in which they have been co-opted. So uh, it's, a, it's a very important point that you made. Uh, and how do we make sure that uh, our language, our, uh, uh, our narratives are the ones that are, that are constantly coming out, even if they're right now quieter than the ones from the, uh, from the dominant system? Does it answer your question? Yeah, it, it does. It, 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 there is no easy answer. I realize that as well. But I absolutely, once again, want to thank the panel. Um, you know, it's, it's like a kid in a candy shop. And for me, I'm like thinking widely about, you know, what are some of the possibilities? And that's the beginning, I believe. I mean, my other thing is that can we introduce this as a compulsory subject in primary school? You know, things like that. This is fundamentally. Uh, progressive and, and the things like making it mandatory as a product development or a process development to make sure that if it is not meant for everybody or at least the majority across the world, across economic and other diversity, that it should not really. And those are the sort of mandates that we can push on, even with the uh, because otherwise, there is this possibility of. The colossal work being done by our panelists today will be taken over again under some sort of a capitalism banner, just as Greenpeace was Milan. And Extinction Rebellion is being called as an activist movement of destroying one piece. So there are some of these real threats that we see, but it's not an easy answer, I do realize. Thank you. Um, Andy, your question. Cool. Have we got time? Yeah, we've got time. Okay, thank you. Your question. Well, I'm just wondering, so wonderful. Thank you so much, Ashish and Nimo, for for joining this discussion. It's been really, really interesting. And I had a question for both of you, actually, uh, stemming from something that I think really resonated, and quite a specific thing in both your talks, but I'd like to encourage you to build on it. And it, the point is this, Nimmo talked about, in relation to harmony, in that lovely analogy a moment ago of, the, of building Buckingham Palace in the village, and what that does to other people in the village. And you, Ashish, spoke about this general quality of not subverting diversity. And I think your most example is a good one of. And it made me think, it's obviously central to the pluriverse, this general quality of not subverting diversity is central to the pluriverse. But I'm not aware, it may just be my ignorance, of a significant current analytical political discourse about what that quality is. I'm, I'm aware of there's you know anti-pluralism, anti-diversity mean opposing the idea of diversity of groups, but that's not the same thing as a generally not subverting it. Then there's ideas of co-thriving or coexistence in around GM foods and organic or around social ecology, and they mean things that happen to get on together well. So there's words for that, there's people analyzing those qualities, but this general quality central to the pluralness of not subverting diversity in general, like not building, not building palaces in villages. That I'm not sure, I'm not aware. And of course, it's, it, Ivan Ivich was getting that kind of thing with conviviality. But I'm just wondering, do you know of anywhere where that general quality is being discussed? Because it seems quite central to what you've both been saying about harmony and about pluralism. Nimo, go ahead. You you go first this time. She said, "I think you have the floor." Um, <laughs> that um, I, I don't think I have an answer to that question, so I, I don't want to. Uh, the 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 sort the sources of. Um, the conversations we're having and the struggles uh, towards realizing the realignment we're looking for uh, are not may not really be um, 
This is an education of the streets and of the struggles. Uh, there could be, I'm not, I'm, I'm sure there was a thousand, there may be a thousand and one uh, sources or maybe there's none, I'm not really, uh, that, that is not, um, I cannot address that, but I, I, would, I would just like to say that uh, in the struggles of life, sometimes we don't have written references. Um, but that doesn't mean that they don't exist. Uh, I would have actually asked you the question. Maybe you give me the answer. What, why, are they, why are the sources not available where you are? Uh, how come nobody is studying those things, those concepts are producing the resources that are needed? Uh, maybe I could turn the question back to you because I, I cannot, uh, that's the best way I can address it. Good question. <laughs> 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 okay, maybe uh, a few additional thoughts here. So I think, I mean, uh, in line with what Nemo just said, if you, if you were to look at the struggles for and the articulation on self-determination, it actually is a powerful articulation for diversity. Because if I, uh, uh, my community, say the Quechua indigenous nation in the Andes or the Sapara indigenous nation in the Amazon or the uh, Gondi, Adivasis in, in, in India, wherever we are, are saying we have, we claim the right to self-determination and we will assert our cultural and economic and political, uh, uh, spiritual uh, worldviews in, in the way we want, but we will do it with responsibility. In a sense, they're saying, um, but they're also not saying that I want, therefore, the whole world to be Quechua or Sapara or, or Gondi, right? They're saying just, we, no, we want to do this, which means in that sense, and they know the fact that there are other cultures and other societies that exist, and they're not wanting to hegemonize them. They're not wanting to dictate and, uh, their terms over them. That is a fundamental argument for diversity and pluralism, right? Even though they may not say it in the, those sort of uh, words or that kind of academic uh, language. But if you're looking for uh, articulation in the more academic or more sort of written forms, then uh, which diversity? There's a lot of work that's been done on the importance of maintaining language or linguistic diversity, which is as threatened as biological diversity in the world, probably even more so. And the articulation and the studies on why that is important, because every language hides a library of knowledge. And the more we lose languages, the more we're losing knowledge. Let's just give you a simple example. From northern India, there's a state called Himachal Pradesh in, in the Himalayas in India. Uh, one, uh, one person has done a study uh, across India of languages and he says there are 230 different words for snow. In English, snow, in that state, 230 different words, Okay, different sizes of snowflakes, when the snow is falling, how fast it melts, etc., etc. Everything has a different word. What that encompasses in an incredible amount of knowledge of winter. What does winter mean, right? Which will be so important for us to deal with climate crisis. Now, um, so people have articulated that in fact, and there's academic publications also, which talk about how there's so much of an importance for this and how in fact biological and language diversity are so integrally connected. Because you also tend to find that where there's the highest biological diversity, there's also the highest linguistic diversity. It's a very interesting coincidence, not a coincidence, it's, there's, a, there's a link. And so uh, for those kinds of specific things, you will find, I think, if you're looking for academic literature or for uh, more sort of studies and things like that. But in general, the notion of diversity, I think, is, where you're, is, is what you're going to find implicitly articulated in the movements of the world such as the self-determination movements. Thank you. I guess the people are the rest of us, are you? Mm -hmm. Are you satisfied with the rest? Yeah, of I'm you? totally satisfied. It's, it's great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so people like me still have questions, but we'll come to the end of our session today. It's almost 4 o'clock. And we've had an engaging conversation. Um, Nemo and Ashish, Ashish have both put their contact details in the chat box and links to resources. We can, can, can you copy them as well? The first one. So you find them um, on our website. 
after today, we find the recording and hopefully um, Nino and Ashish will leave their slides so you can also find them on our website if you want to catch up. So thank you everyone for joining today. And thank you Nimo, Ashish, Saurabh and Andy for engaging us um, throughout the session. We're looking forward to continuing this workshop, workshop sessions next week with a presentation from Gracie Sapinski on global value chain. And Gracie will be here in person. If you haven't already registered, please go to our website and register for the event. Um, and for those who are here with us, you talk as well to tea, coffee, and biscuits. Um, you can still have computer with Andy here. There's a lot of write up on the computer. So if you're just ready to answer some of your questions, and also next up with yourselves. Um, so have a good weekend, everyone, and I'll see you next week. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Ashish. Thank you, Thank you Nemo, very, Thank very you. much. Thank Take you care. very much. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Namaste. Namaste. <laughs> Thank you. Take care. We learned that from the movies. <laughs> <laughs> How do you say it, Nemo, in your, uh, how do you say bye or see you soon? Or... Uh, uh, there are many ways of saying it. One way is uh, Tiesom. Tiesom. Tiesom, yeah. Oh, oh. yeah. <laughs> there are so many languages, I get confused. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Bye -bye. Tiesom, bye. Thank you again. Thank you. Bye. bye. Just thank you.